As part of our look at material memory, I wanted to highlight um, some a particular set of objects that is often associated with memory, which is mourning and memorial objects. Objects in a variety of different cultures that are used to mourn or remember um, the deceased. Often these objects are specifically tied to funeral rites or particular rituals of mourning and also represent in many ways um, specific cultural beliefs about um, the afterlife or a spiritual beliefs. So first among funerary objects, um, here are a few objects from um, the Mayan and Zapotec uh, traditions. Here's a Zapotec funerary urn from Oaxaca. Um, and when we look at funerary objects, we're looking at objects that were both intended to provide some sort of housing for the deceased in which actual um, human remains are contained within, but also objects that are buried with the deceased to accompany them to the afterlife. And in this case, we see uh, one of the latter objects. And here's a, a Zapotec um, funerary urn. Again, um, representing um, uh, a deity that will accompany the um, deceased. Um, in the Quiche Mayan tradition um, of southern Guatemala, urns were more than strictly figurative. They actually contained the remains of important individuals who either place in the urn as tightly wrapped bundle or through a secondary burial of remaining bones. And these then were buried within pyramidal um, structures or, or other kinds of tombs. Um, others were contained in sacred caves where people would make pilgrimages and give offerings um, to the deceased. In this case, the front of the urn is adorned with the image of what is likely an ancestor who at death was transformed into the spirit embodiment of a deity, in this case, the sun god. And we see him uh, emerging from the, the um, mouth of a shark, which symbolizes the watery underworld. Here's a funeral urn from uh, Colombia, and these urns are found in chambers inside deep shaft tombs, uh, specifically in, in northwestern Colombia. Now these urns also contained human bones, which were redeposited in these special containers after the flesh was removed, either through cremation or through burial in the ground for a period of time. Now these also have a deeply spiritual significance. Um, the the tombs were meant to were believed to be links to the honored dead. The bones were perceived as seeds from which a new life would spring. So by redepositing the bones, um, the skeletal remains inside the urns and then placing them within the tombs, the, in a sense they believed that they were planting bones like seeds um, in these phallic shaped urns inside a womb like chamber, Mother Earth, and that renewed life would spring from the burials. And this apparently is a tradition that we can continue to see among present day Desana people of Northern Colombia, uh, who consider the grave to be a kind of uterus to which um, the physical part of all humans returned at death. We also see funerary urns in various Asian traditions. Here are some from the Song Dynasty. Uh, here's a Hun Ping a funerary urn from the Western Jin dynasty. Um, this kind of urn was known as an urn of the soul, a symbol symbolic dwelling for the spirit of the deceased. Um, and so we see a profusion of figures that were molded and then applied to the sealed lid, lid with a kind of multi-story platform. Um, and and uh, these are real and mythical creatures that are portrayed on this vessel. Um, that are, uh, you know, monkeys, bears, dragons, kneeling fingers, figures, immortals, birds. Um, this is the iconography of early Chinese funerary art. But we also see depictions of Buddha, uh, identified in a meditating posture. Um, and uh, this kind of, this jar actually reflects a very formative stage in the development of China's um, Celadon uh, pottery glaze tradition and also at a moment when Buddhism was entering um, Chinese uh, culture and religion um, in a big way for the first time. Uh, here's an example of a Korean 
um, funerary urn. And these were actually used uh, to use to store the um, ashes of the deceased. And then here's another a funerary urn from um, Cambodia. And of course the classical Greek funerary urns which were also used to hold the remains of the deceased and also uh, some were used to hold um, oils which were uh, meant to accompany the deceased to the afterlife. And we of course see um, the tradition of urns primarily now in contemporary uh, America often used um, to house the cremated remains um, of the beloved deceased. Sometimes these can be decorated within specific spiritual traditions or other kinds of art or cultural um, motif traditions. In other cases, they're tied to the expression of specific religious beliefs or in other cases contain imagery like this soccer ball, um, which are part meant to represent the personality um, and the spirit of the, of the beloved person who is gone. We also see distinctive funerary art in the African-American tradition. This is actually um, a funeral jug, which is decorated with an image and um, items that represent the personality of the deceased. We also know in the African-American tradition, uh, there are traditional um, modes of marking graves. And of course, while we still see many you know, floral arrangements and other contemporary standard American uh, practices used, we also see some traditions that are specific to the African community. In this case here, we see um, a grave being decorated with white seashells. And this is believed to be related to um, a Bakongo belief system uh, from Congo. Um, many of the enslaved persons who were transported to this grave is in South Carolina were from Congo, um, and, and in the Bakongo religion, the world of the dead is known to be underground, yet underwater. And so the white color marks uh, the nature of the person as deceased, and the shells and stones signal the boundary of this watery w realm. Um, so again, this, this particular practice representing beliefs from Central Africa. We also see um, both in Africa and in um, the southern United States, the decoration of African American graves with a variety of household objects. Sometimes this can be a single emblematic object, like a pitcher or a vase, or can represent an inventory of a, the deceased person's household goods. So we find clocks, cups, saucers, toothbrushes, piggy banks, marbles, and many other things. Um, this is also believed to date back to customs in West and Central Africa. We know that in Congo, for instance, um, indigenous people marked the final resting places of their friends by decorating graves with old cooking pots, and they would poke holes in them to, to make them useless. Um, or sometimes pieces of cookery knives would also be used to decorate graves. So we can identify this as an African retention. Sometimes we also see contemporary graves um, decorated with pebbles and again, shells, uh, which are meant to represent this um, ocean or lake of the underworld, the afterlife. Um, in the 19th century uh, context of the United States, during the Victoria era, Victorian era, uh, the age of sentimentality, we see a, a wide variety of objects that were constructed and created to mourn the dearly departed. This is an interesting morning sampler, and this is um, one kind of textile art that was done. And what's interesting about this is that it also incorporates the funerary um, imagery of the, the headstone and the urn with um, the weeping willow. This was a common um, imagery used in the first part of the 19th century in the United States um, as part of the cult of, of sentimentality to indicate the the um, the mourning sentiments of those. Um, we even see images of, say, George Washington being wept over by women um, at his gravesite with a weeping willow. So here's another sampler that depicts that. And we can see how it's drawing directly on the iconography of um, 
gravestones during this period, and we of course remember this from Dietz as well, the willow and urn imagery of gravestones during this period. Um, this imagery was also incorporated into mourning jewelry. This is jewelry that um, people would wear um, while they during the period of mourning after someone died. Um, there were specific dress codes for doing this, of course, as well, wearing black and then moving from black to black and white and purple over time. But there were also specific items of jewelry that were um, created to, to be worn to remember the deceased. And here are some other examples of that mourning jewelry. You can see that they almost invariably incorporate a black and white or black um, color scheme. Another um, Victorian curiosity of the cult, uh, the culture of sentimentality and the preoccupation with death and mourning is the creation of hair jewelry. Um, this is jewelry that was woven out of hair uh, that was part of the deceased body or could be the hair of a loved one who was still alive uh, that then would be woven into these intricate designs to create rings, earrings, necklaces, brooches, bracelets, any item of jewelry. So here's some examples of that. Here's some other examples of 19th century hair jewelry, earrings, a pendant, and a pin. And of course the ladies um, Magazines uh, printed patterns and instructions for creating this hair jewelry, but it also became such big business that in fact there were companies that were devoted uh, to the creation of hair jewelry, and it was a whole mail order business where you could send in the hair of, of your beloved and then choose what pattern you wanted it to be woven into. And this is an example of one of the catalogs for ordering this kind of jewelry. We also see hair incorporated into um, mourning jewelry, often um, braided or woven or um, constructed in um, elaborate designs. So we see the, 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 the braid here on the one on the left, but then these two on, brooches on the right, both are the design within the brooches created through um, the use of hair. And then this is another uh, set of um, morning lockets which also incorporate um, the hair of the deceased. Now, this is something that's very specific to 19th century culture, especially 19th century American culture. We also have other more contemporary um, ways in which we commemorate the deceased. Um, here are um, funeral cards. These are cards that are printed up um, uh, to remember the deceased given out at funerals. These, this is something that we still have today. These are from uh, the 1890s and 1904. Um, this one is from 1905. And this one here is actually from 2008. So we see that this is a actually a, a practice that's a custom that's continued up into our contemporary era. And then there are also um, a number of different artifacts that you can um, order to be given out to mourners at, at, a, at a ritual funeral, um, whether it's um, these kind of funeral cards or funeral uh, or mass programs uh, that are given out, or in the case of the right here, these are fans for church that um, commemorate the deceased. And other forms of memorialization um, run the gamut. In some cases, um, tattoo art is used as a form of memorialization. Here we have Mona, get me a beer, somebody's dad that they portrayed. Um, here's a tattoo um, commemorating 9-11. There's also, um, in the late 20th century, emerged this tradition of memorial murals, as particularly in urban neighborhoods where there was a high um, level of um, street violence, gang violence, or other um, uh, criminal violence, and people, many young men being killed um, in violent incidents, including some with the police. And so these mem memorial murals became a way to commemorate um, uh, within the, the, the visual language of um, street art, um, neighbors who had fallen. So here's some examples of those. 
Here's one, of course, that has a number of different interesting motifs in it, the Puerto Rican flag but and, and the angels and a dove, but then also this teddy bear with a yellow ribbon um, uh, kind of commemorating uh, uh, in, in a way that we see also associated with other tragedies like 9-11. We can locate these memorial murals in, a, in a, a much broader tradition of creating a shrines, a tributes, or other um, installations that uh, provide offerings to the deceased or provide a kind of um, memorial site uh, when someone has died in an accident. Uh, we saw these after the uh, created all over New York City after 9-11, but they also have their roots um, in specific cultural traditions as well. One is, of course, the ofrenda, which is associated with the Mexican Day of the Dead, in which an altar is constructed uh, to honor uh, deceased ancestors, which includes um, photographs, images of the deceased, um, objects, flowers, food, um, and there's a whole um, iconography or stylistic vocabulary that goes along with this particular tradition in Mexico and Mexican-American life. So here are some examples of ofrendas. We also see the creation um, in contemporary United States in a, in a variety of regions of people who have died accidental deaths, either people who were shot and killed or people who were died in motorcycle or um, motor vehicle or bicycle. Um, accidents and we see these spontaneous shrines that get created both again we see the use of the teddy bear balloons flowers personal objects people might leave liquor people might leave um, items that relate to the personality of the deceased and then again this the stuffed animals often used to convey this this message of comfort so here's a shrine in East Oakland in memory of someone who was shot and killed in an argument uh, here's an example of a, a roadside shrine, which we see these all over now. Um, here's one that was, was erected in Clayton County, Georgia in 2011 uh, to memorialize three teens who were killed by a driver. Uh, we also see uh, sidewalk shrines to victims of bicycle accidents. There's one actually in, uh, that's been in Decatur for some time now. And then finally, I just wanted to reflect on um, the role of objects in the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and people's experience of this particular memorial. One of the things that the Smithsonian has been doing uh, for some time now is collecting and uh, accessioning into its collection objects that are left at the site of the memorial. And we see a wide variety of objects that are left. There's a lot of army boots that are left. Um, here are somebody's uh, army boots and their um, their commendations are also left there. There might be personal um, testimonies, photographs, um, cards. Um, here's a, a, then we also see objects that are related to the personality or interests of the deceased, like a baseball. Um, here's somebody's a shoe uh, along with a wreath and an image. We also see these kind of um, folk art dioramas and um, the things that get created to represent maybe the battle in which somebody died or some other aspect of their life. And like I said, some of these have actually been accessioned into the collection of the Smithsonian. Often these are th things that objects that have been created or handcrafted by people who come to memorialize their loved one. Uh, this particular pair of safety pins was actually left um, at, at, by the name of somebody who uh, never got to meet their, 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 their baby, their child. The other thing that's really, I think, is really interesting at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is the role of touch and the, the, the sensory engagement with the memorial. 
And we see this also with things like objects from 9-11, the debris from the 9-11 site. People feel the need to touch it, to encounter it. We see this a lot at uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. People locate the name of the person that they are remembering, and they often want to take a rubbing of the name or, or touch the name. And so you see a lot of images of people touching the names on the monument, um, whether they're leaving an object or not. Again, I think this really points to the need to manifest uh, not only mourning, but also memory as a material sensory act. We want to see, we want to feel something, touch something, hold something, or create something to remember those who came before.